Awan Mance has been at Mills since 1999. She currently holds the May Treat Morrison Chair in American History. She received her PhD at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her book, Inventing Black Women, African American Poets and Self-Representation, from the University of Tennessee Press, 2007, and the paperback edition, 2008, was named an ALA Outstanding Academic Title. She's currently working on two projects. We Are Rising, an anthology of African American poetry from the first 50 years of freedom, and Before There Was Harlem, an anthology of African American literature from the long 19th century. Please welcome Awan Mance. Um, I thought today I would share a little bit from the introduction to Before There Was Harlem, which is um, a comprehensive anthology of the black 19th century, um, the long black 19th century, uh, um, 1805 to 1910, yes. Um, so these are the first uh, few pages, and I have my timer so that I will not go over. All right. Before There Was Harlem. On July 29, 1895, the first Congress of Colored Women convened in Boston, Massachusetts. The culmination of more than a decade of black women's political organizing, this gathering represented the first attempt by African American women to organize at the national level around issues of common concern. The assembled delegates, 104 black women representing 54 clubs from 14 states and the District of Columbia, heard speeches on a range of subjects from traditional women's issues to education, economics, religion, and more. Principal organizer Josephine Ruffin spoke on the importance of academic and moral education for African American women of all regions and classes. Writer and activist T. Thomas Fortune addressed the gathered delegates on the subject of political equality and under the leadership of Ida B. Wells Barnett, the Committee on Resolutions issued a call for employment equality for all African American workers. Among the invited presenters was New York-based novelist and reporter Victoria Earl Matthews, whose speech titled The Value of Race Literature established her as one of the earliest African-American thinkers to envision the study of US black literature as a discrete field of inquiry. Her address defines the literature of any given race as all of the written up ex expression of its people and is inclusive of both creative and scholarly works. In the following definition, she clarifies her aims. By race literature, we mean ordinarily all the writing emanating from a distinct class, not necessarily race matters, but a general collection of what has been written by men and women of that race. History, biographies, scientific treatises, sermons, addresses, novels, poems, books of travel, miscellaneous essays, and the contributions to magazines and newspapers. Conceived in this way, race literature becomes the fullest and most accessible record of a people's capacity for analysis, reflection, and invention. Its preservation safeguards not only a, a body of texts, but a cultural and intellectual legacy. As such, Matthew's call for the preservation and study of race literature is as concerned with conserving the African-American written tradition as it is about a way, a way, a raising and maintaining awareness of the culture and community out of which that tradition emerged. Indeed, she writes that, quote, race literature does not, does mean the preserving of all the records of a race and thus cherishing the materials, saving from destruction and obliteration what is good, helpful, and stimulating. But for our race literature, how will future generations know of the pioneers in literature, our statesmen, soldiers, divines, musicians, artists, lawyers, critics, and scholars? It is unlikely that Victoria Earl Matthews herself could have imagined the current state of African American literature studies. Although the last 25 years have seen significant progress toward the recovery and authentication of early African American texts, the vast majority of 19th century US black writers and their work remain largely unknown to contemporary readers. Though little more than a century has passed since she, she so clearly and thoughtfully mapped out the relationship between race, literature, intellectual history, and cultural memory, the richness and breadth of African American literature of the 19th century has faded from memory, along with all but a vague awareness of the intellectual and cultural debates 
political and social struggles, community publications, and institutions that fostered and sustained US black writers and their work. The failure of increased access to 19th century black texts to bring about a broader awareness of the period's black intellectual and literary communities is a direct result of the ways that the preferences and concerns of contemporary scholars in the field have shaped and limited the manner in which pre-Renaissance writers and their work come into view. Contemporary US black literature scholarship highlights those texts that have come to reflect not so much the interests and priorities that shaped the creation of past literatures as the interests and priorities of the current population in looking at the past. One factor shaping the interests of contemporary African American literature scholars is the desire to find and celebrate the progenitors of today's black writers and texts, as reflected in this excerpt from a 1997 interview with African American literature scholars and Norton Anthology co-editors, Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Nellie McKay. McKay explains the impetus behind the anthology's attention to early black texts, quote, we are interested that people should understand something also that comes from the beginnings of US black literature tradition. Where do we begin to see the quality and the depth of the kind of writing that we have now? Where did it come from? And we can look back to the earlier writers and find it there. For the current novel-centered moment in literature, this search for the roots of the, quote, quality and depth of the kind of writing that we have now entails first and foremost a search for early black novels and novelists, with a similar interest in early book-length memoirs and autobiographical narratives, as well as those poets and short fiction writers who were fortunate enough to see their works collected and published in book form. In the current literary moment in which the most celebrated African-American works have been those that seek to interpret African-American perspectives and experiences in ways that are comprehensible to black and non-black readers alike, the search for the roots of today's US black literature has also meant greater attention and visibility to those 19th century African-American writers, uh, African-American texts that were most widely known to white audiences. The impact of these preferences on the current US black literature canon is apparent in the 19th century selections that appear in influential collections like the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature and Call and Response, the, liter the Riverside Anthology of the African-American Literary Tradition. And these books were published in 1997 and 1998, uh, respectively. Their consecutive release marked a turning point in US black literature studies. Although these are neither the first nor the most recent general anthologies in the field, the ambitious scale of each of these volumes, and each includes more than 2,000 pages of selections spanning more than 300 years of written and orally transmitted texts, um, and the canon-making authority of their presses, Norton and Hooten Mifflin Harcourt respectively, have combined to create what Richard Elias Fox calls, quote, the most formidable anthologies of US black literature ever produced in the field. The Norton, in particular, has since come to dominate the market for US black literature anthologies. In fact, just within months of its release, it had already logged record-breaking sales. Houghton Mifflin has not released sales numbers for the Riverside Anthology, but anecdotal evidence suggests strongly that it is the second most ordered anthology of US black literature, though certainly a distant second. As the two most widely purchased, widely distributed, and widely taught African-American literature texts of the last 15 years, the Norton and the Riverside have each played a critical role in defining African-American literature canon. The influence of these anthologies has been greatest in the subfield of US black literature before the Harlem Renaissance. While a number of African-American writers from the Harlem Renaissance onward continue to draw a steady audience of mainstream readers, only a handful of 19th century black writers remain consistently in print. And as the most prominent of the general anthologies in this field, the Norton and the Riverside are many readers first and in most cases only encounter with African American literature of this period. The Norton and the Riverside have selected as the most canonical, most essential black texts of the period, those writings distinguished by their effectiveness at conveying African American experiences, aesthetics, and ideas across racial lines, most often in book length monographs and collections. So I'm going to just take a little leap ahead um, and get to a more, um, just kind of bring it on home to the idea where I want to kind of stop for today. Um, and I'll just talk through a little bit, which is um, to say that because of the bias towards book length narratives that communicated and were most widely known by white audiences, there are an awful lot of writers who are completely erased 
but the erasure of large numbers of black writers isn't the main story when it comes to the relationship between canon and African American literature. Um, and so I'll just pick up here with the discussion of Frederick Douglass. Um, as a result of the ways that these anthologies are created and as a result of the bias of contemporary scholars in looking at the past, a handful of 19th century black writers, uh, Frederick Douglass, Francis E.W. Harper, Charles Chestnut, and Booker T. Washington have become familiar to both scholarly and casual readers of 19th century African American literature, while the vast majority remain unknown. The current book-centered moment in US black literature scholarship impacts not only which writers make their way into the canon, but how. I guess I have a couple more minutes. Um, and this is epitomized by the coverage of Frederick Douglass and his work in today's most prominent African-American literature anthologies. Today, as in his lifetime, Douglass is easily the most widely recognized of all black 19th century authors. However widespread his notoriety among today's readers, <coughs> the range of works associated with him is nevertheless quite narrow. The emphasis on his book-length autobiographical writings in the Norton and the Riverside, each of which reprints his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass in its entirety overshadows his participation in African-American intellectual, political, and aesthetic debates. In addition to his narrative, both anthologies include excerpts from What to the Negro is the Fourth of July, one of his most celebrated abolitionist speeches. Though Douglas was an active participant in 19th century African-American literary and intellectual culture, the selections in these anthologies portray him not as a writer shaped in part by the uh, aesthetic practices, ideas, and debates that define black literature, black literary and intellectual communities of the time, but rather as an isolated respondent to the debates around black freedom and equality that took place among activist whites. Few anthologies include Douglass's serialized fiction, nor do they include any of his editorial pieces written on the issues and concerns of Northern blacks. The emphasis in both the Norton and the Riverside on his narrative and his abolitionist speeches obscures the degree to which the aesthetic choices and political perspectives evidenced in Douglass's work were shaped by ongoing discussions around politics, culture, and education that were taking place within the period's black readership. I think that's where I'll stop for today. Thank you.